Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. The sound of honking horns signaling frustration with Michigan's stay-at-home order. And we're getting new perspective on the risk healthcare workers face every day treating people with COVID-19. Thanks for being with us for the News at 6. State and local leaders say there are positive signs amid the coronavirus crisis. But Michigan's numbers continue to add up to so much tragedy. Another 153 people confirmed dead from COVID-19 in the last 24 hours. We've now lost 1,921 Michiganders. The case total of 28,059 includes more than 1,000 new positive tests. A new drive through testing site will open tomorrow in the parking lot of the Sam's Club on North Line Road in Southgate. And a new executive order says nursing homes and other long term care facilities must inform employees and residents whenever a resident tests positive for COVID-19. Separate units for coronavirus patients will also be required. Meanwhile, Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan says he believes the spike in deaths has more to do with inconsistent reporting at the state level and people passing away after being on ventilators for two to three weeks. And he spoke about some positive signs that he's seeing at hospitals. When I look at how many patients are on the ventilators in the hospitals in Detroit, they're down significantly. Uh, when I see what the usage is over the TCF center, it's lower than anybody would have projected. Uh, if we keep our social distancing, uh, we're going to be out of this sooner rather than later. Mayor went on to say the deaths in Detroit are now doubling every 10 to 12 days, which is a sign the daily numbers may be poised to drop significantly. Well, now, despite that optimism from the mayor, we know Detroit hospitals have been under duress, and we're learning of one instance where that led to a heart-wrenching mistake. Yeah, a local firefighter was told his mother had died of COVID-19, but Sinai Grace Hospital wasn't able to locate her body. Mm. Sean Lay live with how this happened and how the hospital is responding. Sean. My goodness. Unbelievable, guys. Tonight the DMC is apologizing to this firefighter and to the firefighter's family. The Detroit firefighter's mother died here of COVID-19 last Wednesday. The hospital unable then to locate her body for six days. Carolyn Pollard fought coronavirus inside Sinai Grace for three weeks and two days. We asked her son Alfonso May about her fight. Lonely. Lonely. The 68 year old known as Bonnie lost her fight exactly a week ago, April 8th. May is a Detroit firefighter. Not only is he devastated over losing his mother, he says Sinai Grace lost her remains. He says the hospital told Wilson Aiken's funeral home that Pollard's remains were ready to be picked up last Friday. Pollard's body could not be found. The funeral home went back Sunday. They went back three times on Monday. May says Sinai Grace could not find his mother's body. There's no other way to put it but to say that they lost my mom's remains. Last night, nearly a week later, the remains were found. May says hospital security says they were found among other bodies piled up in vacant rooms at Sinai Grace. May says he was praying his mom was not one of those bodies. is grieving you telling us that you can't find my mom's remains um not good i want to read you the entire statement we got from the detroit medical center it says quote our hearts and prayers go out to the family for their loss and the pain they're experiencing at this difficult time patients who pass away at our hospital are treated with respect and dignity we have talked with the family we have offered our sincere apologies for the delay in providing their loved ones remains to the funeral home and expressed our condolences for the loss of their loved one. Firefighter we're talking to, Mr. May, says his focus is now uh, a proper service, respectful service, uh, a send off, he says, for his mother. As a first responder, he says he understands when facilities like Sinai Grace are overwhelmed, but losing the remains, he says, is absolutely unacceptable. Live on the West Side tonight, Sean Lake, local four. And you see his uh, his broken heart there really uh, wide open for all of us to see and our thoughts and sympathies are with him and the family tonight right Sean indeed
All right, well, we thank them every day. Healthcare workers who put their health on the line to care for people affected by this horrible pandemic. One of them, a physician's assistant at U of M Hospital, took the time to make this powerful artwork of her co-workers' faces. These are real people fighting real battles. And now two new reports from the CDC are putting numbers on the risk they face. Our Dr. Frank McGeorge joins us with a look at how serious this really is, Doc. Yeah, Kim, you know, it is very serious, especially for certain groups of healthcare workers. Now, before I talk about the numbers, I want to emphasize even the CDC acknowledges these case numbers are underestimates, but the job types, ages, and other demographics of the most affected are likely accurate. Of the 315,000 COVID-19 cases reported to the CDC between February 12th and April 9th, there were over 9,000 who were identified as healthcare workers. Now, as large as 9,000 is, it's most likely a serious underestimate because less than one in five reports actually included any information on whether the patient was a healthcare worker. Now, among the healthcare workers where information was collected, the average age was 42. 73% were women, 72% were white, and most, 55%, only had exposure to the virus at work. Now, 723 were hospitalized and 27 healthcare workers died. Again, likely an underestimate. But on a percentage basis, healthcare workers were less likely to be hospitalized than the general population, probably because they tended to be younger. On the other hand, among the deaths, most were over 55 years old. The researchers suggested older healthcare personnel pay extra attention to PPE and have preferential assignments to lower risk areas. Now, the other CDC report detailed the transmission of COVID-19 to three healthcare workers by one patient at the start of the outbreak in California. That was before the careful use of PPE. Three factors were identified that increased the risk of transmission. Exposure during nebulizer treatment, exposure during non-invasive ventilation with BiPAP, and increased time in contact with the patient. Now, I've got to tell you, everyone in healthcare takes all of this deadly serious. And more than anything, these numbers show that without proper protective gear, we are all at risk on the job. But it also shows we have exposures outside of the hospital. Those are the same exposures that everyone, all of you have. Back to you. Doc, you and your colleagues continue to have our, our deep and profound admiration and gratefulness. Uh, we are learning more about one of the people who've lost, uh, whose job meant risking exposure to COVID-19. Paul Novicki, a Huron Township para uh, paramedic, was just 51 years old. His family tells us he was an active outdoorsman with no underlying health conditions. Paul's wife shared their story with Victor Williams in hopes that other lives can be saved. This is a situation that will be rough for anyone. Imagine losing your spouse that was fine at one point, and then all of a sudden, they're gone. It was very difficult, not knowing day to day or minute to minute, waiting for the phone call from the hospital. Six long days have passed since Huron Township fire medic Paul Novicki seemingly died out of nowhere. He had no underlying health issues at all. Um, very active, very athletic. I mean, he hunted, he fished, he went on hikes, he, you know, yard work was very active, loved the outdoors. His wife, Christy, believes that only a few weeks beforehand, Paul came into contact with the virus while on the job. We found out um, that his partner actually from work had tested positive. Um, and literally that afternoon, Paul started getting sick. The fire medic now leaves behind five children along with his wife, but social distancing has made the grieving process so much harder. The virus that put him there also kept us from being together as a family to console each other because you can't mourn the way that you normally would. We, we can't be together. I can't hug my kids. I can't hug my mother-in-law. As a first responder, Paul spent decades of his life saving people, which is why even in his death, Christy believes that he's still serving his community. If these interviews and his death has just one person changed their mind to stay quarantined and to stay safe, then he's still doing his job. And Christy's having a very hard time holding everything together after the loss of her husband. So if you'd like to help her out, visit clickondetroit.com. Victor Williams, Local 4. Okay, Victor. Well, in Lansing, they held what they called Operation Gridlock, and it certainly lived up to its name. 
The rally made national headlines after the governor went on national television to talk about the COVID situation here. With a closer look, we turn to Local 4 Business Editor Rob Maloney live in Lansing tonight with more on a rowdy afternoon there, Rod. Devin, I've been doing this 25 years here at Channel 4, covered a lot of rallies here. I've seen rallies maybe as big as this one, but I'll tell you what, the traffic was lined up all the way to the highway, which is over a mile from the Capitol itself, and they started honking horns at 10 a.m., and they just stopped 15 minutes ago. Apparently on the short list for the Democratic vice presidential nomination, Governor Gretchen Whitmer appeared on the third hour of the Today Show, saying... Michigan has the third most COVID-19 cases in the nation right now, and we are not the third largest state in the nation. That tells you we've got a unique crisis on our hands and that it demands a unique uh, solution. That unique solution fell flat with thousands who attended the Operation Gridlock rally today. Among them, Conservative Coalition spokesperson Michonne Maddock, a Milford business owner. And it feels like Gretchen Whitmer is doing this more, it's almost like a publicity stunt. That's really what, that's really what it feels like. And it also feels like she's mocking Michiganders. Maddock also mentioned the governor's Comedy Central appearance right after implementing her executive order a couple of weeks ago. She found that disconcerting. Now the governor did see the rally today. She kept busy speaking with other governors, even House Speaker Lee Chatfield, who said of the governor's national television appearances. Michigan's an important state in 2020, so I think that's why you're seeing the national attention on it right now. But today is not about the national attention. Today is about the people of Michigan who are frustrated because they feel their livelihoods have been taken away and they're voicing that frustration with government today. Now, what the speaker wants and what a lot of the protesters wants is the governor to come up with a plan to get Michigan open fast and open safely. Reporting live from Lansing, Rod Maloney, Local 4. All right, Rod. President Trump and his coronavirus task force are holding their daily briefing right now. We are streaming that on clickondetroit.com. Uh, the president says General Motors will be shipping 600 ventilators later this month. It's amazing. It's, uh, you know, what they've done in a very, very short period of time. They're now making thousands of ventilators and they're coming out of the factory very rapidly at a clip that nobody can even believe. But we have others also doing it. And these are very high grade ventilators. So we're helping a lot of people. And at this moment, nobody needs them. Uh, we have to remember during the surge, nobody's needed them for weeks now, uh, but we'll have them for stockpiles. Much more from the task force and the full national perspective coming up at 6.30 on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. All right, Devin. Well, uh, every different type of snowflake has been falling <laughs> out of the sky today. Let's uh, check in with Ben. Yeah, it's coming down at a good clip in some areas, and we are not done with it this week yet. We have more snow on the way, and it could mean more accumulation before the weekend. That's all next. A local school district is about to roll out what it calls week five and says enrichment learning is over. School learning is about to come back into session next week. I'll explain.